let's improve things for everybody and raise uh, the, the quality of life for everybody. Today I'm meeting with one of our city councillors via Zoom, uh, Councillor Rawson King, first black city councillor in Ottawa. Thanks for the opportunity to do a one-on-one -on -one interview. Oh. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a pleasure, uh, obviously, uh, you know, being um, the city's first black city councillor. Uh, I think it's important uh, for uh, me to demonstrate support uh, for uh, the Black community, uh, as well as the racialized Indigenous communities as well. Um, communities that unfortunately have been traditionally marginalized uh, within our city. Uh, but I think the good news is uh, we're seeing opportunities where our community can have a greater voice and our community can have greater participation in economic development. And um, I was really happy to and to have seen uh, the first uh, Black Business Expo in Ottawa. I think uh, that's a very important milestone. We have uh, serious business people in the city undertaking um, you know, the creation of, of great products and services and initiatives. And uh, we need to acknowledge that and we need to most importantly support um, their, their initiatives with our dollars. So it was a uh, it was really refreshing to see the depth and breadth of uh, all of the people who are in the business community and their contributions uh, in, in terms of uh, growing wealth, especially in the Black community. So uh, it was exciting to, to be there, uh, to meet uh, all sorts of people, including yourself, and uh, mm -hmm. to provide some support. And, and thank you so much for your support in what I do. What drove you to run as a counselor? Like, what inspired you to um, to do so? Well, it was primarily in response to uh, multiple things in in my community. But one of the things is I uh, represent Rideau Rockcliffe, and uh, most people are familiar with Rockcliffe, uh, which is um, you know, um, an, a high income heritage neighborhood uh, within the city. But uh, there are other addresses in um, our ward, uh, my ward, uh, which have people um, at uh, with the lowest incomes, uh, not mm -hmm. just in the city, uh, but in the province and the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a member, I was a president of a community association of, of that community, Overbrook, that has a lot of these challenges around uh, income disparity. And uh, to me, it made sense uh, that uh, there was a voice ar around council uh, talking about the need to address poverty through poverty reduction strategies, uh, through uh, food uh, security uh, strategies, and also uh, the need uh, to address uh, issues around uh, racism through the establishment of a of a anti-racism office at the city anti-racism secretariat, as well as uh, the city's uh, first uh, anti-racism strategy that will be coming to council in June of 2022. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of needs in our neighborhood. Um, you know, I, I was a vol I'm an avid volunteer. I was an avid volunteer before I was elected. And it's hard to see people in need around you all the time um, and not really try to step up and say, you know, I'm going to try and represent, uh, you know, some of the most marginalized people so that we can advocate for uh better investments and better quality of life for people. And so that, that was the driving factor for me, um, you know, child poverty, um, lack of opportunity for youth, um, higher uh, crime rates uh, that need to be addressed, uh, not uh, primarily through policing, but through social investments. Um, you know, I think often at city council, uh, we're dealing with planning and development issues. Uh, but we spend a huge proportion of our budget um, mm -hmm. you know, um, in excess of a billion dollars on um, the uh, deployment and, and the implementation of social services. And, and those are mandated. That's a mandated um, thing that uh, municipalities have to do um, according to the province. And so I think it's important for us to um, you know look at that seriously, look at the way that we uh, utilize those resources in a serious way and um, also see if we can expand 
and, and even evolve the way that we uh, see the deployments of, of those resources so that they start to filter down directly into uh, communities, including the Black community, the Indigenous community, mm -hmm. racialized mm -hmm. communities. Uh, it's important that we actually uh, push for that. So those were motivating factors for me. Uh, my motivating factor is really improving the quality of life of people, uh, improving their lot in life. And uh, if we can, uh, you know, continue to do that every day and see some level of improvement in, 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 um, in communities, then I feel that I'm, I'm achieving something. Mm -hmm. How are you encouraging the support of Black businesses during this pandemic? Oh, I've been going to uh, Black businesses that have been opening. Uh, I've ha actually, early in the pandemic, held a roundtable. Uh, that was uh, focused on uh, economic development and small business uh, opportunities. Um, uh, throughout uh, my term, actually, I've held uh, specific roundtables for the Black community, um, as well as um, we even had a budget consultation that was specifically targeted at the Black, Indigenous, and racialized communities. Uh, so in order for us to really grow wealth, um, it's important for us to ensure that we are emphasizing uh, uh, the uh, the creation of small businesses and, and ensuring the stability of, of small businesses, especially in the Black community. Now, it's important to understand, of course, that uh, cities uh, can't give direct aid to, uh, to businesses. Uh, we just start prohibited by the Municipal Act in doing that. So uh, we can't bonus out or just give uh, businesses money or grants. Uh, mm -hmm. We can only at the municipal level, uh, support businesses in a sense uh, through uh, you know the the services that they'll provide to the city through procurement, and mm -hmm. uh, what I've been trying to do as well is work with my colleagues to enhance those procurement opportunities uh, for um, uh, the Black community and other uh, communities as well. Um, and that, that's very important because the city also spends a billion dollars in, in procurement a year. Uh, so what we need to see is um, accessible contract opportunities uh, for Black businesses. I supported mm -hmm. my colleague, uh, Councillor Dudas, who introduced a, a motion to review bylaws, uh, mm -hmm. especially pertaining to social procurement. And I added a direction to that to say, um, if we are looking at social procurement opportunities for social enterprises, uh, for uh, business-like structures that might be nonprofits who are focused on providing products and services, but providing them in such a way that they provide skills um, mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, whether it's students or whether it's newcomers, um, that um, that model is supported uh, and that we are focused on equity, diversity, and inclusion including those newcomers, including the Black community in those procurement opportunities at City Hall. Uh, okay. so that's, that's a substantive thing, as well as the anti-racism strategy that will come to council in June. Uh, there will be a specific area focused on economic development, and we'll be uh, talking about ways to ensure that we strengthen despite the fact that the city, like I said, can't give money directly uh, to these businesses as grants, um, the, the city can ensure that through its procurement opportunities or uh, through its uh, support and advertisement of, of different types of businesses that we're providing uh, more support and more spotlight on Black businesses um, and um, ensuring that um, at the end of the day, there's no discrimination in terms of accessing those procurement opportunities at the city. Uh, I've been over the term uh, really thinking about that seriously. On top of going to the uh, Black Business Expo, going to openings of Black businesses that are might be in other wards that are not close to mine, mm -hmm. but anytime mm -hmm. I get an invitation, even sales events and and um, you know um, opportunities uh, to uh, access uh, Black businesses to to really promote uh, their goods and services uh, during COVID, I've been happily doing that because um, if we want to uh, have uh, a better quality of life in our city, we have to ensure that there's more wealth in our communities and the. The key way to build that wealth, in my estimation, is by building strong small businesses. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now with my next question, you've partially answered it. What are the issues um, that you're, you will be tackling or are currently tackling? Can you elaborate on that a little more on what you're currently uh, tackling right now? Absolutely. So uh, one of the key areas is poverty reduction. Like I said, uh, when I ran, it was because uh, there are too many people in poverty in my ward. And uh, I worked uh, with community associations and organizations in, uh, in my ward and throughout the city. Uh, we published a 50 page uh, white paper uh, calling for the needs for uh, investments in poverty reduction strategies. And I, I'm pleased that that advocacy uh, led uh, to uh, the creation of a poverty reduction strategy at the city. So the city will move ahead with that, with goals and targets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's very important. Uh, it, part and parcel of that was also food security. And so it's important for us to actually address food security. Um, we saw actually an increase in, in need around uh, food security during uh, the pandemic. Uh, and so um, we also will have a food security uh, um, policy and, um, and initiative at the city uh, that will uh, look at ways of ensuring that uh, people have access to uh, good, healthy uh, food. And uh, it will also be uh, culturally sensitive um, because not everybody eats the same thing. And it's also going to focus on ways of making people food secure versus just saying we're going to invest in uh, food bank, food banking. And because I think if the more investments we make there, uh, the more we're admitting we're failing. I think we have to figure out ways to ensure that there's income adequacy so mm -hmm. that people don't need to depend on food banks. So part and parcel of that is if people can actually be in work, um, if they are not, um, if they're not uh, kind of restricted by disability or by mental wellness challenges, if it's really mm -hmm. a question of finding work or different economic development opportunities so that they can thrive, uh, you know, that's something that we, we want to do. And then um, the other element, like I said, um, and it cuts across a whole swath of uh, different areas that the city is, is, is focused on is the creation of an anti uh, racism um, strategy that will come to council uh, this June. And that mm -hmm. was driven by the community. So the community said, we want a strategy and they've actually been defining what they want to see addressed in, in, in that strategy. And they mm -hmm. said specifically, they wanted uh, to address areas such as employment equity at the city. So if you're applying for a job at the city, you want to know that you'll get a fair shot at that job. And if you are, um, you know, if you are, if you do win a job competition, you get a job at the city that you have a good chance of, uh, you know, um, advancing of, of promotion. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to ensure that there's a focus on economic development opportunities, mm -hmm. so everything mm -hmm. that we're talking about, like ensuring that we create uh, environment that will allow businesses to thrive. Uh, we want to see improved health outcomes for our communities, uh, whether it's the black community, uh, the indigenous community, racialized communities, even religious communities. Um, we want to see uh, better health outcomes, especially around mental health. And so I think about the black community where uh, there hasn't been traditionally uh, mental health programming, and there's a lot of stigma around mental health. So we want to invest in that. We want to also invest in youth outcomes, improving youth outcomes. So mm -hmm. ensuring that there's programming, uh, whether it's educational, um, recreational, or entrepreneurial programming, especially in critical hours when kids come home and their parents might not be there between four and six, that they're engaged in uh, productive, um, you know, activities uh, that will uh, really potentially either build skills or uh, ensure that they are in a safe environment um, and that uh, they are getting the supports that they need to be successful. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we've been working on that. And the idea of the strategy is to provide a blueprint uh, for future municipal budgets uh, so that we see these key areas, including economic development, small businesses you were talking about, uh, where we identify opportunities and then at the end of the day, in future budgets, we can say uh, we have identified these as priorities. Now we're going to look at serious ways of funding them.
Mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, what I've been what I've been doing. We've been really focused on attempting to have a social transformation in in terms of the uh, systems and the initiatives that we are suggesting that we put in place, um, so that uh, we improve quality of life for people and um, and improve uh, their potential and especially the potential of our, our youth as they're coming up. I want youth who are growing up now, unlike our generation, uh, where uh, you know we might have had challenges getting a job at the city uh, mm -hmm. because of systemic racism, we want that to be addressed. Where you know people might have had problems getting contracts at the city um, as as a as a, a black owned business, we want to uh, address that. We want to ensure, as example, in housing, which is another area that the report will address. When you're a newcomer, you want to ensure that you're getting quality housing and you're not in uh, the shelter system as you come in for more than 12 months, uh, that there's culturally sensitive and appropriate housing that's run by, as example, uh, black owned uh, businesses uh, led by black owned uh, boards uh, that are driving the development of nonprofit, uh, you know, um, um, housing um, services uh, for black families. Uh, so we're, we've actually started a pilot at the city that's looking at that type of process. Um, so we want to see all of these, uh, you know, concurrent types of investments made. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we started that work uh, in this term, and I've been pleased to have a, a small uh, role in that. Um, it's going to, the hard work is going to be done by the social service agencies, by city staff, by the community itself. But the most important thing is bringing people together to agree uh, to, to move forward, um, you know, with uh, this type of, you uh, of, of, of programming these types of initiatives. So I, I feel that that's, uh, if anything that I've uh, left uh, in terms of a, a legacy, hopefully it would be um, starting mm -hmm. planting the seeds of transformation um, at the city uh, so that we can see greater investments in communities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And regarding housing, uh, we, we see how things are going right now, the trend it's taken. Is there anything in place? Like, um, I don't know if you have any control over that area. So the only control that the municipality has <clears throat> is uh, the provision of public housing, uh, where we can say uh, people um, who require rent gear to income, who are very low income people, and they would not be able to afford uh, market rent, or middle income people who are increasingly not able to afford where market rent is going. Um, we do have controls in terms of the, in terms of the housing uh, offerings that we supply um, as a city through our public housing agency, Ottawa Community Housing. So mm -hmm. I'm pleased to say that we've been advocating for the construction of more housing uh, that caters to middle income people. And so uh, during uh, my term in council, I, I've been very pleased to have secured at least an uh, initial uh, $25 million investment uh, to see the creation of 271 units uh, in my ward um, in an area called Water Ridge Village uh, by Ottawa Community Housing. Uh, it will be located on uh, 715 Mickinac Road, um, and it will be a mixed income development, meaning um, if you have an entry level salary example, you just come out of college or university and you get that $50,000, $60,000 job, which would be an amazing <laughs> mm -hmm. to receive. And you do the math and you might be only able to afford um, you know, $800 or $700 a month. Well, these, are, these units will be geared to that type of demand. It will be slightly under uh, market rents. Mm -hmm. um, and, and actually that's, uh, I shouldn't say slightly because now market rents are are approaching $2,000 uh, for, for one bedroom apartments. But uh, the idea here is if we are serious about addressing a housing crisis and affordability, we have to invest in public housing that we can control. It has to be new public housing 
built mm -hmm. at high quality standards. So we're looking at building a very advanced uh, set of buildings there um, that mm -hmm. would need standard, uh, environmentally sensitive. Um, uh, they would be passive houses, meaning that uh, they would require fraction of a fraction of a fraction to heat, to cool. Um, you know, we, we're looking at putting all the best technology into these units. And at the end of the day, after that's built, it will total a $100 million investment into, into the ward. Um, so I, I'm really excited about that. I'm going to continue to pursue those types of public housing um, opportunities in our ward, because I think that's the way that we really address affordability. And that's what's missing. It's a lot of private mm -hmm, developers mm -hmm. who are building things that are unaffordable because that's how you make money is by by selling luxury um, mm -hmm. but a lot of people in the city um, can't afford luxury and they just need you know uh, something that really meets their needs and um, you know seven hundred thousand eight hundred thousand uh, dollars is a lot of money <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to meet mm -hmm. those needs. Um, but there's nothing wrong with uh, renting um, as long as there's a level of affordability and we need to create those opportunities for people um, so that it's not just, um, you know, the uh, most poor people um, mm -hmm. who have opportunities, but increasingly middle income people as well, who uh, don't have, um, who are not seeing accelerated uh, increases in their, in their wages. Uh, so in my estimation, for both uh, really low income people, and also increasingly for middle income people, we should continue to to invest in in public housing uh, to improve quality of life for people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. And um, how about uh, transportation and uh, roads. <laughs> I think we need to continue to invest, especially um, when we uh, look at renewal of, of infrastructure. We have to do that in a more uh, comprehensive way. And I think that's the problem. People complain because there are potholes here, there's potholes there, and we're only really fixing s small segments. I think that we need to look at ways to uh, do comprehensive uh, fix fixes across the board to infrastructure, and that we need to actually invest uh, when we do that renewal um, in um, active transportation. So ensuring that we're not just focused on the car, but that we're also focused on people who cycle uh, either to work, to home, to play, and as well as pedestrians, uh, you know, because um, uh, there's a high irony in many low-income neighborhoods, uh, there's a lack of sidewalks. So even when you think about that, that's an equity issue. Uh, people who can least afford uh, a vehicle, as an example, um, or who, is, who are more apt to ride a bicycle have less access to that type of active transportation infrastructure. So it's something that we have to seriously look at when we are uh, revamping infrastructure. Uh, treating it as routine maintenance uh, is not going to work. And uh, when we do renew that infrastructure, we have to say, you know what, we are in the 21st century now. Uh, we understand there's a climate crisis. We understand there are different ways that people get around. So we should be looking at modernizing uh, that transportation infrastructure. And mm -hmm. in, on top of that, I'll, I'll just address transit. We also have to figure out ways to make uh, transit uh, more effective, uh, but also more um, inexpensive because we are paying some of the most highest uh, rates in terms of fares in North America uh, for mm -hmm. transit. So um, I, I'm, I'm a realist. I don't think um, that we will get to free transit, uh, but I don't think that people should be paying the highest uh, fares in North America either. And I think that that requires having a conversation, all of this, uh, whether it's trans, uh, tr uh, transportation renewal or transit renewal, uh, it requires, in my estimation, uh, more discussion with senior levels of government who have the financing power to provide us dollars to uh, build out the infrastructure. Because mm -hmm. we have to remember in, the, in 1967, when we were having centennial projects, there, that was a lot of federal money coming into municipalities to build new infrastructure. And now, um, you know, uh, we can hardly catch up with maintaining the infrastructure that is degraded. Mm -hmm. 
So with transit, we need greater uh, operating uh, subsidies uh, from, uh, from higher levels of government. Uh, and it's the same thing with transportation infrastructure, but not just transportation infrastructure to build more roads. I think we need mm -hmm. renewal that ensures that uh, those roads are multimodal. Um, so it's not about expanding capacity for the car per se. It's about expanding capacity uh, in my estimation for people to cycle, to walk, to work, to do healthy things uh, so that we uh, are also thinking about the environment and its preservation. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you so much for your time. Um, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but I know we have about 30 minutes. And I wanted to touch on schools because I, I hear a lot about school. We have um, like the young adults, the young ones. Yes, we, we, we know how to, um, I mean, the parents, teachers, how to take care of them. But the young adults that would like to start college and are not able to because of, you know, what's going on right now. A lot of things are being done online and some need one-on-one -on -one counseling. And a lot of us don't know where to go, how to go about it, or who to contact, you know? Uh, you know, I think it is important at a certain point once uh, we really get past the pandemic uh, to ensure that um, we can get people back in the classroom, mm -hmm. that the classroom has culturally sensitive and relevant um, curricula that reflects uh, our experience and um, also uh, caters to uh, some of our needs. Um, I think that's going to be very important. Um, and I think that's a conversation we're going to have and a balance between um, good application of technology, but enough in-person supports uh, so that uh, people can, can be successful um, in, in their education. And uh, of course, um, you know, we have to look at uh, uh, proper supports, uh, especially for Black and racialized people, Indigenous people, and not just in curricula, but uh, ensuring that um, you know, we're addressing uh, any discrimination uh, that we might see in the educational system um, and, and addressing, you know, systemic barriers that people will have, uh, whether those are cultural, linguistic, um, you know, but I think it is important, and even mental health, you know, specific mental health supports for, for Black community members. Um, I think all those elements need to be uh, reflected as we look at renewal even in our education system. The city is not obviously responsible uh, for secondary, post-secondary education, universities, and we have school boards for that. But uh, mm -hmm. so so often you wouldn't uh, believe. I was sitting down uh, with Black parents talking about um, the challenges that uh, their children were having uh, with either systemic racism at specific schools. You know, so uh, there, there's a lot of challenges mm -hmm. in education, but I think the good news is there's a robust discussion and uh, that's what you need in education is people talking about the changes that are necessary and really uh, pursuing changes there. And I think uh, we're gonna see those changes uh, come, not coming as fast as I would like to see, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I think that we are seeing uh, those changes. The other element too is the affordability. Um, and I think increasingly I look at how much post-secondary education costs versus what I paid for it 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's frightening. I, I think that um, you know we need to ensure that education continues to be affordable uh, for um, students. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. And Absolutely. let's hope that we can talk again some other time. But it's been a pleasure and it's nice meeting you at the event. Mm -hmm. so it's important for us to invest, especially in youth, to invest in our community so that we have the baseline capacity to address these things. Well, if, if, our, if, if you know, the majority of the Black community doesn't have high income jobs, there's not going to be as much tax collected. You're going to have more challenges, whether it's in the criminal justice system or the education system. I'm content with people just ensuring that they're that they're contributing and improving things for their families. Mm -hmm. uh, but we want them also improving things for our city, our province, our country. And so that's what motivates me uh, every day to say, let's let's improve things for everybody and raise uh, the, the quality of life for everybody.